Hello everyone, welcome to Imprint IS. I'm Varun Kular and we're continuing with the India After Independence series. And uh, today uh, we're going to talk about Jawaharlal Nehru in historical perspective, right? But uh, before that, uh, let me get into something. Uh, we'll look into the perspective of the ruling dispensation for a bit, right? So here's a, a cartoon by Shatish Sacharya, one of my favorite. Uh, though he obviously uh, tends to go a little overboard with his criticism of the government, uh, but right. Uh, so here was uh, you know the cartoon here, which is blaming Modi for Kashmir, for China, for Pakistan, UNSC seat, right? So you know the idea was that maybe the Sadar Vallabhai Patel statue is just to spite Nehru. Okay, but that's the basic idea behind this, right? Okay. So uh, previously, uh, we got, uh, you know, after the Pulwama attack, uh, there was again a pressure by India to uh, put uh, Masood Azhar, right? So, Pakistan based terror group, Jashe Mohammed, leader Masood Azhar, right? Um, the idea was that, you know, it should, he should be put in and he should become a terrorist uh, in the name of the United Nations, right? And this was again placed on hold by the Chinese, right? Uh, you know, the idea was that when the Pulwama attack happened, every uh, country actually supported India. Even China was supposed to acknowledge uh, that it was a terrorist attack, right? Uh, the Modi government hailed it as a diplomatic victory. But when uh, they again blocked uh, India's resolution, right, that uh, obviously of uh, banning uh, Masood Azhar, uh, Jaish Muhammad, and Masood Azhar being designated as a terrorist person. So again, uh, they had to do some fair saving exercise. So, Okay, so this was a cartoon, right? So USA, you know, helping India to check, right? And obviously China was blocking and helping back. China again blocked UNSC bid to ban JC Mohammed Chief Masood Azhar for the fourth time, right? And um, what was the reply? And we had, basically he said Nehru was the original sinner and he favored China for the UNSC seat. And today uh, we're gonna talk about all that today, right? Lecture, but before that, we look at a, at an article by uh, Muhammad Ayub, and he is a distinguished professor at university, right? And uh, let's try to appreciate what he says. This finance minister Arun Jaitley recently said that India's first prime minister Jawaharlal Nehru was the original sinner, and he favored a China of India for the permanent membership in the UNSC, Union Security Council. This assertion, um, you know, obviously refers to the United Nations feeders, uh, right, by the USA, that was sent in August 50, uh, right, and this was the idea. But his assertion obviously refers to Washington feeders sent to uh, New Delhi in August 50, 1950 to Indian ambassador in the US, mentioning the American desire to remove China from the permanent membership of the UNSC and possibly replace it with India. The allegation that Nehru uh, refused to take this session seriously and thus indicated, uh, abdicated India's opportunity to become a permanent member of the UNSC is a result of the critic's inability to comprehend the complexity of the international situation in the 1950s and the very tentative nature of the inquiry. That it was only just to check whether India will support or will join uh, the USA group. Right. Um, so. The episode basically uh, took place in 1950. The Cold War was in early stage. Two superpowers, eyeball to eyeball, con you know, confrontation basically threatened nuclear catastrophe. The People's Republic of China, which had just emerged from a bloody civil war, was seen at the time as Soviet's closest ally and was prevented from taking a permanent seat because of American opposition based premise on Cold War logic. And there was a war also raging in the Korean Peninsula. US and Allied troops were locked in fierce combat with North Korean forces supported by China and Soviet Union. So the Korean War handled. So Nehru was trying to, at that time, what was Nehru trying to do? Nehru was trying out to call a policy that ensured India's security, ensured that India remains independent. There was strategic autonomy, uh, and he focused on state tech industrialization. And he was well aware uh, that pushing China out, uh, as US wished to do, was just a recipe for perpetual conflict that would engulf all of Asia. So that was the reason, right, that he said that it was a you know, recipe for conflict. To him, uh, the Korean War appeared as a forerunner to much more such conflagration in Asia that could even turn nuclear. The United Nations had already dropped uh, nuclear bombs on Japan only five years ago and believed that it would not do so uh, you know, in an Asian conflict uh, since nuclear defense had not become a recognized reality. 
So Nehru did not want India to become embroiled in the uh, hazardous Cold War conflicts and become a pawn in the superpower's great game, risking its own security. So that was the argument which Nehru had. Uh, and obviously, uh, Nehru's approach to China was not actually dictated by what is commonly believed that Nehru trusted the Chinese too much, but actually was actually dictated by the real politics. He understood that uh, peace in Asia could not be ensured by, uh, you, know, you know, without accommodating somebody like China. Right? Despite the fact we still have don't have such a great relationship, it could have actually been much worse. And remember, China uh, was India's next door neighbor and it's essential for uh, New Delhi to keep relations with China on even yield, right, and so on. So the so-called offer, uh, right, in a government seat in the Security Council replacing China was made in a combustible con context. It was a vague feeder uh, to explore Indian reaction to such a contingency. Uh, US intended it uh, to be a bait to entice India, right, to into an alliance with the West against the Sino-Soviet bloc. And as it was then known, uh, and Lorit becoming a member of the defense organizations, it had to setting up in Asia to contain, presume, communist expansion. The enticement, as uh, you know, Vikram uh, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit and Nehru makes clear, was suggested during a conversation with the US Secretary of State, right? And when uh, Pandit uh, uh, Lakshmi Vijaya, uh, she um, informed uh, Nehru of these feelers, India uh, became, uh, right, so he responded, India, because of many factors, is certainly entitled to a permanent seat in the Security Council, but we are not going in at the cost of China. And uh, in 1955 September, Nehru categorically stated that there has been no offers of this kind. There was no offer, formal or informal, of this kind. The composition of the Security Council is described by the UN Charter, and according to which certain specified nations have permanent seats. No addition, dilution can be made without amending each other. So USA cannot actually add India, even if uh, for the if we even believe that USA uh, was trying to get India into the UN Security Council, USA alone could never have done so because the UN Charter could not be amended by them alone. Uh, Nehru uh, refused to consider the American feeler not because he was a wide eyed sinophile, but because he was well aware that all Washington was interested was to use India for its own game. And had India uh, accepted the American bid, it would make enduring enmity with China without achievement of a permanent seat in the USC. Uh, the Soviet Union, um, then China's closest ally, would have actually vetoed anything, right? Uh, remember, right now we are close to Russia, but we were not close to Russia in 1950. So it would actually, you know, people in, in today's world don't realize this. Uh, it would have just sold relationship between India and Soviet Union and made it impossible to establish a trust later required to play the close political and military relationship that became necessary once USA entered into an alliance relationship with Pakistan. And the Indo-Soviet relationship paid immense dividend to India during the Bangladesh war. And obviously, uh, Jaitley and other critics of Nehru, eminently sensible decisions to not, not fall into the American trap, would do well to analyze the decision in this particular context and political context in which it was made and not allow the current political preference to declare the immaturous Conclusion. So basically, Jaitley is just trying to be an amateur, he's trying to mislead the Indian public, uh, because obviously, if you delegitimize Nehru in the, some way, in the same way, you delegitimize the Gandhis, and that is the Congress party today. And that's the primary opposition of the BJP. And that is one way of thinking about it. So uh, let's start the chapter. So Jawaharlal Nehru in historical perspective. So uh, if you think about Nehru, why does uh, you know Narendra Modi talk about Nehru so much? At the end of the day, Jawaharlal Nehru can be justified, really thought of as the architect of modern India. Remember, Gandhi died very quickly after independence. All that we see in India, organizationally, uh, institutionally, is seen to be Nehru's solution. He was a democrat, a socialist, a humanist, a visionary. And uh, remember, uh, at that time, uh, if you think about poverty and misery today, uh, the period was even much more. And then why did his presence make so much of a difference? What were the abiding elements of Nehru's uh, contribution to the making of in India? What was his legacy? Uh, why is he uh, seen to be so great okay, at the end of the day? And um, the uh, so let's talk about his personal touch first. So uh, Nehru, the person, was great, you know greatly admired by everyone. Uh, anyone who met him fell into his spell, his range of interest, 
and his concerns were wide indeed. He had from basic education to heavy industry, from statistics collection to world peace, from uh, women liberation to tribal cricket, uh, right, uh, tribal welfare that is, uh, art, uh, mountain climbing to cricket. He in some ways was the veritable reference man. Besides being the product of enlightenment uh, with commitment to rationality, humanity, and respect for individual, he also focused on this independence of spirit and secularism. Uh, he tried to actually, one other thing which he did was he actually wrote regularly to all the chief ministers, right? So when once uh, his, uh, you know, letters he wrote, if India has to be really great, as we all want her to be, uh, then she is not to be exclusive either regularly or externally. She has to give up everything that is a barrier to growth in mind or spirit in so, uh, or in social life. So I think the same thing, if you know, if you apply it to ourselves, that would be great as well, that we have to give up everything that is a barrier to our growth and in our mind, in spirit or in social life. Anything which is a barrier, right? We have to grow and we have to be great. And that is what Nehru was saying in, in some ways indirectly to all of them as well. So uh, Nehru, if you think about it uh, before anything else, was a nationalist. And even his uh, enemies would never accuse him from thinking any any uh, other terms, but national terms. Uh, remember, uh, you know, Nehru spent more than ten years in jail, right? And anybody who criticized him first please tried doing that for the country, then you know, try to criticize the person like that. But anyhow, maybe we should not say such things. It's just that if you think about Nehru, his you know, he didn't care about caste, he didn't care about creed, he didn't care about any loyalty. Uh, remember his first, uh, if you have, you know, if you look at his first uh, cabinet, it had Shyamal Prakash Mukherjee, it had B. R. Ambedkar, both of his were in a staunch oppositionist. And they used to you know, oppose Nehru at every place. So remember, uh, Nehru's broad mind mindedness was very different from what we have today. But let's go ahead. Uh, so what does independence mean to Nehru? Uh, for Nehru, uh, independence meant beyond political independence. He was strongly committed to change, development, the development of an equitable, egalitarian, just democratic society, a socialist society. Uh, though he didn't never define socialism, uh, maybe Fabian socialism come in, you know, close to it. Uh, he laid down the foundation of a democratic civil libertarian polity, and he consolidated India to what it is today in some ways. Uh, but remember, uh, despite you know his influences, Gandhi and Marx, uh, both of them never provided a guideline how to build a nation. He had a hard task with a degree of excitement and optimism. Uh, he had always believed that India's greatest need was a you know, sense of certainty concerning a known success. So I think this is the same line I will tell my old my students. You need to have a sense of certainty concerning your own success. You need to believe that you will clear all you know, the exam. You need to believe that you will be successful in life. And that sense of certainty is a need that we have. Okay. And this sense, uh, obviously, of excitement and faith in the coming success, uh, he did not abandon even after his defeat in the 1962 China War. And he's, you know, he was very successful in imparting the sense to millions of Indians. In the same way, if you think about um, Narendra Modi today, uh, it does, you know, if you compare Nehru and Modi, I would say that this, in this sense, uh, you know, Nehru, Modi also makes Indian, Indians believe that they would be successful, and you know, the sabka saath, sabka vikas concept is based upon that. Uh, democracy, rule of law, respect for the freedom and dignity of the individual, social equity and equality, non-violence, rationality in the guidance of human affairs and morality-based politics were the pillars of his approach to nation building. Okay, so that is what uh, his thought process was. Uh, let's talk about how there had been consolidation of India uh, or the consolidation of Indian independence. So remember, uh, what was 1950s like? Uh, India had just become independent. We were still, you know, threatened by the fact that we will be colonized again. The world was sharply divided between two superpowers, United States and Soviet Union. And uh, Nehru resisted all the pressures and refused to become the pawn. And Nehru also successfully resisted the penetration of India's political and economic structure, institutions by outside agencies. Uh, Nehru, you know, with a great deal of success, built an independent and self reliant economy all-out effort to break out of the colonial development he ensured wanted to actually and when we talk about the indian economy how it grew in the coming lectures we'll talk about how in agriculture industry we actually became more and more self-sufficient 
and uh, what basically Nehru did, he made it the foundation. So initially, all our equipments were imported, right? But in India, if you, I, know, I remember in the 90s, right? Uh, and right, I remember watching Pakistani serials, and I always saw, you know, foreign-made cars in Pakistan. Right. On the other hand, in India, we had Indian made cars. And I was always worried, you know, I was always fascinated by Pakistani seals at that time that, you know, they had those foreign made cars. But my father made me realize that it was because we are not importing and we are self sustaining. Right. And he said that it is, you know, much more cheaper that we have a Maruti rather than we buy a Toyota. Okay. So that is, in some ways, uh, the technical modernization and the training of large technical and scientific cadre were regarded as Nehru as his effort at economic self-development and self-reliance. Uh, we actually, uh, you know, increased in the number of uh, scientists we had, the number of engineers we had, the number of doctors after independence by many fold. Uh, for, then uh, let's look at how what Nehru did for forging national unity. Now, the problem was that uh, India was not India when uh, 1947 happened. Uh, we had casteism, provincialism, tribalism, linguistic chauvinism, uh, which were largely transcended during freedom struggle, surfaced again, right? The princely states were there, and there was an ever-present danger of communism. And Nehru recognized that India was never uh, not a structured nation, but a nation in the making. And he kept in view this and made allowances for India's immense variety and diversity. He constantly argued people to develop an outlook to embrace all the variety and consider it as a so unity and diversity, the concept that Nehru gave. And uh, so he basically talked about the fact that nation building can only happen if we are uh, united despite adversity. Uh, he also saw that India's unity and independence were closely related. He said that we live in a dangerous age where only the strong and united can survive and retain our freedom. Uh, what did Nehru think about nurturing uh, democratic and par parliamentary government? He uh, very uniquely, right? Uh, if you think about Nehru, he could have become a dictator, right? But he carefully nurtured and entrenched democracy and parliamentary government in independent India. He fought uh, three general elections on the you know basis of universal adult franchise. Uh, he realized the fact that despite the fact, you know, think about how popular he was, uh, still he never got more than 50 percent, 52 percent votes ever of the total number of votes. So he was still committed to democracy and civil liberties. And he said that he would not give up the democratic system for anything. And that he would, though, you know, if you think about democracy, and development will be slow in a democracy. But he said still that, yes, we will still have democratic process and a libertarian tradition. Uh, he created an institutional structure where, dem where democratic, uh, which was democratic in the Congress and in every organization, and which, which was diffuse. The constitution uh, was with basic liberties enshrined. Uh, a sovereign parliament elected on the basis of universal uh, suffrage, uh, the regular elections, free press, a cabinet, government, and an independent judiciary. Uh, he basically talked about democracy in a very different way. He actually used a lot of uh, literature. He said that our democracy is a tender plant which has to be nourished with wisdom and care. Uh, Nehru's idea of democracy was intrinsic to the idea of social and political democracy. He said that democracy would actually enable the people to mobilize themselves and exert pressure from below to achieve social justice and equality, as well as reduction of economic inequality, uh, which in time would lead to socialism. He said that because we're so over in India, uh, it, socialism is the only answer, but you know, obviously after LPG, this has not been the case. And, uh, right now, uh, the British thought process that India would be a uh, kleptocracy, right? Uh, maybe going, we're going towards that more and more. May, maybe India is ruled by money more, money power, right? In some ways, because democracy is aligned by and these two ails today. Uh, though, you know, let's get back on I Nehru. Mean, he said that no amount of force and coercion could keep India together. He said that any reversal of democratic methods uh, might lead to, a, you know, disruption or violence in India. Uh, Nehru was always aware of the formidable and noble, unprecedented character of his effort to uh, develop the country economically on the basis of democratic and civil liberty structure. He realized that most other nations and societies had used authoritarian and administrative measures and institutions during the period of economic takeoff. And you know, obviously, we are always compared with China, forgetting the fact that we are a democracy and democracy has uh, ills as well. 
and throughout uh, his life you know if you think about him uh, nehru opposed dogma and a dogmatic uh, mentality uh, this was his major objection to religion and he became a major ground for his you know uh, this favoring a scientific temper and outlook on life and its problems uh, let's now uh, look into the next uh, thing that nehru on socialism Nehru uh, rejected uh, the capitalist developmental and civilization perspective and instead worked for a social fundamental transformation of the society in a socialist direction obviously he could not really succeed in building a socialist society but uh, he did uh, grapple with the socialism in a developed country uh, obviously his ideal on socialism and his strategy on establishment development and also his political tactics provides deep insight to the problem of socialist transformation in the modern world uh, but first uh, let's try to define what does socialism mean to him to him socialism meant a general equality of opportunity social justice more equitable distribution of higher incomes generated through the application of modern science technology to the processes of production uh, the ending of acute uh, social and economic disparity generated by feudalism and capitalism and he basically thought that application of scientific approach to the problem of society that is also cons- you know consist of socialism uh, but you know if you think about it you know uh, this is not the socialism we actually have even today in in any part of the world uh, obviously but remember what nehru actually wanted was a better state and with socialism he said that it concerned greater production for there would be no equal distribution of power and for him socialism was equal to greater production and equitable distribution what actually socialism india in india became was inefficiency right instead of greater production socialism meant i could be lazy because i am not getting the reward right so uh, what does uh, you know what all things that nehru did of uh, socialism he actually describes his reforms as a surgical operation he said the socialist revolution would thus be consist of series of surgical operations performed uh, through a due process of law by democratic legislature he believed that democracy and civil liberties had to be the basic constituents of socialism which is not the case in any part of the world and were inseparable for it so very interestingly um, something which he says surgical operation i think we associated with something very different surgical strikes by narendra modi i guess right um, anyhow like the surgical strike on black money by narendra modi demonetization right uh, so what does they think about social change he says uh, one has to carry people uh, with him they must be willing to accept changes and it is very ex- important that a large section of society accept it or passively or actively be ready to accept it, right so he was important to carry the message of socialism the people he wanted people to accept socialism right he said um, we are not a sectarian body consisting of the elected we are a fellow traveler with the people of india right and uh, there are several qualities of this right uh, first uh, the process of social transformation might be have to be slowed down for reconciling different views outside and inside the congress party of winning active and passive consent of people was time consuming and nehru was willing to slow down the pace of social development in order to persuade people Uh, they argue that the absence of broad societal consensus any radical um, step towards socialism would invite the danger of fascism nehru was very well aware of the social presence of powerful landed elements with the social prestige and economic power and numerical strength he was also conscious of the fact that his party despite its charisma and popularity secured then 50% of the votes casted in the 1952 and 57 elections uh, the different right is political elements together constituted 25% of the popular vote for the lok sabha elections in these years and this was besides the right wing strength inside the congress remember uh, congress does have a right wing strength even before independence it was not all socialist uh, there was very, you know sri rajagopal chale raj rajpat rai all of them but a lot of right just for there above all he felt that the middle strata urban and rural had to be handled with care for they constituted a very large section of the it was the middle strata which had formed the backbone of fascism in germany any frontal attack on the properties classes were likely to push them and the middle strata to taking a fascist position uh, which in some ways is happening uh, now uh, what did nehru think just before his death 
he think he succeeded uh, because a lot of time uh, you know nehru was criticized for being very gentle he was too soft right during the 1962 war he was said to be too trusting right he was said to be no wise etc etc he said that one should not mistake gentleness and civility of character for weakness they criticize me for my weakness but this this too large a country with too many legitimate diversities to permit a so called strong man to trample over people and their ideas and if you think about uh, nader modi right um, uh, being a strong man uh, i think that is been the biggest weakness of him that because there too, you know too many legitimate diversities uh, if i think about one of his weaknesses is the fact that he can't speak in tamil telugu malayalam etc right uh, and that kind of makes him uh, the other the outsider right so if you take a game of game thrones crawlery right the south of india thinks of him as an outsider all this so uh, one reason uh, nehru adopted a open ended approach to towards socialism was because of his belief that it is not possible to mobilize a large majority around a clear cut structured ideological definition of socialism now uh, we we'll next look at the next topic which is planning for economic development so nehru uh, looked upon rapid economic development as the basis of india's independence and unity and for the removal of poverty and implementation of social welfare uh right if you think about the objectives of planned development in the third five plan he says a high rate of economic growth sustained over a long period is the essential condition for a achieving a right rising level of living for all citizens so if i think about it if uh, india has a growth rate of 10% for 7 years our income will double okay so when we say farmer income double by 2022 then the modi is joking because we need a 10% growth rate for 7 years consecutively and that's not happening at all so um in the other section uh, the session of the congress uh, which was also talking about you know what kind of economic growth rate uh, or economy we will be going into whether it's a mixed economy or a socialist economy or a you know capitalist economy he said that we cannot have a welfare state in india with all socialism or communism in the world unless our income goes up socialism and communism might help you dividing your existing wealth if you like but in india there is no existing wealth for you to divide there is only poverty to divide and how can we have a welfare state without it? so india can only become a welfare state when we are economically strong and uh, if you look at india uh, you know nehru's pillars of development strategy uh, it was a wide spread you know uh, acceptance that planning for rapid industrial growth a public sector was required for to develop strategic industry and a uh, mixed economy so nehru popularized the concept of planning and made it a you know part of the indian consciousness of uh, india was to have a mixed economy as it was a transition state uh, with the private sector functioning for a long time to come within the framework of plan and he was to occupy the commanding heights in the long run only for controlling all basic industries of strategic sectors so that the profits could be due uh, nehru was very clear also about the cooperative principle should be encouraged in trade industry and agriculture and that's why we have all those cooperative banks that we have even today uh if you think about the industrial draft resolution he said uh, the public sector was expected to augment the revenues of the state and provide resources for further development in fresh fields take for the example this investment that has been done by the modi government the last one year uh he forced ongc to buy hpcl very interestingly and provide uh in the money for the disinvestment reducing the fiscal deficit so the public sector was expected to augment the revenues of the state the same argument you you know can be used for the rbi uh, excess um, you know reserves that they have and why the government wants those so nehru wanted to build an independent self reliant economy for independence depended upon the strap economic strength and capacity to resist economic and political domination emphasis on industrial rapid industrialization and agricultural self 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 sufficiency planning public sector and heavy capital goods industry minimal use of foreign capital right and so on was seen to be in a roots views that it is you know necessary for the independent economy uh maybe perhaps the most controversial uh, topic is how to oppose communism remember uh, when gandhi died uh, he was very very angry and um, and the rss so nehru actually was very committed to secularism and was unsurpassed he thought that uh, communism was against his grain and he fought and he defined communism as the ideology which treated hindus muslims sikh or christians as a homogeneous group in regard to political or economic matters 
as politics under some religion scarred of one religious group being incited to hit the another religious group. So Nehru was the first to understand the social economic roots of communism, and he came to believe it was primarily the weapon of the reaction. And even though its social base was formed by the middle classes, he most perspectively uh, described it as the Indian form of fascism. In contrast, he regarded secularism as an essential. Remember, he did not distinguish between Hindu, Muslim, or Sikh. Uh, when the you know, Punjab Subha movement happened, he opposed it totally. And he was opposed to uh, you know, minority communism as to the communism of the majority religion. It was only, remember, only after Nehru died in 66 that, you know, 64 he died, and 66 Punjab and Haryana and Himachal were divided. It tells you that till he was there, he opposed. A major lacuna of Nehru's approach to the problem of communism was, uh, which can be seen in certain economic uh, deterministic and reductionist basis, is that he thought that planning, economic development, or spread of education, science, and technology would be good. Right? He ignored the need for a struggle against communism as an ideology. As a result, he paid little attention to the content of education or to the spread of science and all the scientific approach among the people. And he was compromised uh, with his stand uh, once uh, in Kerala, that is, when uh, Congress was permitted to enter alliance with Muslim League and Christian communal groups uh, in 1960. So that kind of, you know, that was the first dilution of the anti communal stand. Uh, Nehru Mokasi was a modernist. Uh, he opposed conservatives. Uh, he did not devote much time or effort to social reform in the narrow sense of terms, but uh, with the help of B.R. Ambedkar, he was able to pass the Hindu code bills. But he promoted education among girls and a public employment of middle class. We think about it. He was against, you know, he was a modernist in some ways. Uh, in foreign policy, we've already talked about him. He used it as an instrument to defend and strengthen India's newly found independence. He safeguarded India's national interest and to develop self-reliance, self-confidence. And he enthused the pride of Indian people, even while serving the cause of world peace and anti globalism So uh, if you think about Nehru, um, you know, Nehru's place in history could, uh, you know, should rightly take his account his political weaknesses. Uh, but he still, you know, towered over others. Uh, you know, uh, a critical weakness of Nehru's strategy of consolidation of the Indian nation, uh, economic welfare and transformation, uh, flowed from his non adherence to the country strategy of non violent struggle in one crucial aspect. On the mobilization people. Nehru, you know, didn't mobilize enough people. He thought that people would uh, casually, you know, vote for their own interests, but that uh, there is no doubt that the Nehru. Uh, very deeply and passionately for the people, his sway over the masses was immense, as was his capacity to communicate with them, uh, to sense their feelings, to win their affection, uh, to trust. Nehru was his own model of development and social transformation depended on active pressure from below by the deprived, the exploited and the dominated. Nehru failed to create, uh, help any institution or structures or agents through which uh, people or even lower level cadres of his uh, party could be mobilized, activized, or politically. Nehru in the period uh, did not witness quite a part except in the form of election. Uh, there was a gradual demobilization of people and leaking over time of the link between politics and national leadership, in power also between political and constructive social work. Uh, Nehru also failed uh, in some ways to build certain institutions uh, to you know, implement his vision to mobilize people behind it. He created no social instruments, uh, and this led to a general weaknesses in the execution of his policy. And that was the major reason for the shortcoming of the implementation of land reforms, the execution of the community development program, and the management of the public sector. Right. Remember, he had never been an organizer, and that became a serious flaw. It was Gandhi and Star Patel who were the organizers. Uh, when Nehru became the sole leader, uh, Congress became uh, weakened as an organizer. The consequence was that Nehru increasingly started relying on government machinery, and you know, in some ways, Nehru became the government. Like from the reformist, from the Democrat, he became the government. That kind of uh, ended into bureaucratic control, the village social level worker, the kingpin rural construction became a cog in the wheel. And obviously, that kind of led to the failure of the command development program. Command development program, that is. Right? Nehru obviously vigorously did not attack uh, 
through mass mobilization and mass educational campaign uh, the caste system male domination kinship economic dependence of rural poor on rich and growing corruption which was bolstering the existing social economic system right so uh, if you think about it, he basically went too far in stressing the role of consent and conversion of the dominant social classes uh, right but remember gandhi believed in organizing active political and ideological struggles uh, against these targets which he did not a part of gandhi's strategy was to convert them and isolating them from which nehru did not so that was the weakness of nehru in some ways uh, but on the other hand you could see nehru uh, acted he denounced the corruption caste bureaucratization and ills of his developing exclusive society but he was unable apart from exhortation to take necessary steps maybe he died too early maybe the arc report came too late and by the time he could actually lose he actually died that was in some ways a problem uh, to conclude nehru was the first prime minister of independent india he was facing a daunting task uh, but jeffrey tyson says that the best way He says if Nehru had been a different kind of a man, India would have been a different. And that tells you everything, right? And it tells you that he's a sheet anchor for Indian people. Uh, today, even if we criticize Nehru for uh, the ills we have today, after 50 plus years of his death, it tells you what Nehru was, right? With this, we end. Uh, if you have any questions or queries, do let me know. Thank you so much.